The Austria theory of the business cycle, that's up for this morning. Uh, I use the term a lot, capital-based economics. It's more substantive title, not that I have anything against Austria, although some of my students don't know where Austria is, and <laughs> others call it Australian economics. And it really gets bad. So capital-based macroeconomics, and that's, that's more uh, substantive. So we're going to look at uh, sustainable and unsustainable growth. Okay, and I start out just with the elements uh, of Austrian economics, and it's, they're, they're pretty familiar. Uh, production possibilities frontier, the loanable funds market, that's just supply and demand of loans as with the interest rate in play, and then structure of production, of course, that's hardcore Hayek and Menger and Mises too, but without drawing the pictures. Uh, then there's stage-specific labor markets, which come along with uh, the structure of production. Different parts of the production have different uh, wage levels. And then applications, just two applications, uh, sus sustainable growth as supported by saving, uh, and then unsustainable growth that's triggered by credit expansion. So that's the that's the contrast that we're going for, and I, and we call this the you know the business cycle lecture, but the first part of it, the sustainable growth, will probably take more of the time than the business cycle. But once we get through uh, the growth uh, aspect of it, then we can. We can see what happens when you have credit expansion instead of increased saving. Well, you all know Mises uh, and Hayek, and we can dispense with that. Let me come back here. Uh, here I want you to realize, if, as if you didn't already, that Keynes theorizes in a at a high level of aggregation, uh, so high that he just doesn't, he doesn't get to see the picture of uh, a structure of production. Uh, and looking below, says so seeing unemployment and resource idleness as the norm, Keynes called on his counter-cyclical fiscal and monetary policies, and ultimately for a comprehensive socialization of investment. That's Keynes' swan song in the last chapter of the general theory. Okay, now we've got Friedman here. So Friedman uses even a higher level of aggregation. So what he focuses on is the equation of exchange, MV equals PQ. And the Q uh, is a variable that includes both consumption and investment. So you don't see any changes relative to those two things at all. And Friedman says, seeing no problems emerging from the market itself, he focuses on the relationship between the government-controlled money supply and the overall price level. Well, of course, Hayek focuses on the different price levels and the different stages of production as governed by the interest rate. So here we have Hayek. So capital-based macroeconomics is distinguished by its propitious disaggregation, which brings into view both the problem of intertemporal resource allocation and the potential for a market solution. Hayek shows that a coordination of saving and investment decisions could be achieved by market-governed, that's important, market-governed movements in the interest rate. He also recognized recognizes that the aspect of the market economy is especially vulnerable to the manipulation of interest rates by the central bank. Okay, so if you get market governed movements, you don't have any problem with the business cycle. Uh, if you have uh, the government uh, at play with interest rates, then you do have a problem. So a lot of the 
of, of my early slides uh, will show uh, the savings part, and then we'll go to the printing part. Okay, so here's a production possibilities frontier, sort of a standard thing. Uh, consumption on the vertical axis, investment on the horizontal. So under favorable conditions, which means let the market at work and keep the central bank at, uh, out of the picture, uh, under favorable conditions, a fully employed market economy allocates resources to both uh, uses making the most of the trade-off. Well, yeah, so we could show that up here in the diagram. The PPF is often used for emphasizing the concept of scarcity. Can't go beyond the frontier, at least not by very much. You can go a little, it turns out, but it, it causes trouble. Uh, so there's an implied trade-off here Expositing theories of capital and interest, economic growth, uh, international trade, a lot of things, but the PPF rarely appears in macroeconomic construction. Well, it appears in mine. It, it appears in the Austrian view uh, of business cycles. So investment here represents investment which includes uh, replacement capital. Let's look at that. Can hardly see the lines there. But you have replacement capital, not as much as gross capital. The difference between uh, the replacement and the gross uh, magnitudes constitutes investment, which allows for exp the expansion of the economy. So you see where the negative, where the net investment is. So with positive net investment, the economy grows. The PPF shifts outward from year to year, uh, permitting increased levels of both consumption and investment. We'll see how this works. Uh, this investment-based uh, outward shifting of the PPF represents sustainable economic growth because you've got some net investment there. So you can see it grow, you can hear it grow, you know, whatever you want. Looks like that. All right. So four periods of growth are shown with consumption as well as saving and, and investment increasing each period. That's because there's savings going on. And so the economy grows. The actual rate of expansion of the PPF depends on many factors. Uh, first and foremost, a change in saving preferences. Uh, a change in saving preferences, which provokes a movement along the PPF and affects the rate at which the PPF expands. So it, it's not that all of a sudden people decide to save, it's more like demographic factors that uh, as those factors change, it may be that overall there are more savings uh, in the economy than before. So suppose people become more thrifty, more future oriented, they reduce their current consumption and save instead. Okay, again, look at the PPF. Here's what it looks like. Watch the movement along the PPF. There it goes, All right? And so with increased saving and investment, the economy grows at a faster rate. Well, sure, you got savings to work with. You can hear oh, a lot of this good growth. <laughs> okay, so let's compare the high growth economy with the original economy. There's the one I started with. So with no increase in saving, the economy grows at a modest rate. You see that. Uh, and with initial increase in saving, investment increases. 
at the expense of consumption, after which both consumption and investment increases dramatically from period to period. You can see that. Then you can get the comparison, we'll just go across there and you see your higher level. You can, you can easily tell that. All right. So loanable funds theory was a staple of Keynesian economics, pre-Keynesian economics. Uh, and that's just the supply and demand of loanable funds. Interest rates on the vertical axis, saving and investment are on the horizontal axis. There's the, uh, the savings. Okay, demand reflects business community uh, willingness to borrow and undertake investment projects. So that's the that's that part of it. So with interest rate serving as a price, uh, loanable funds theory is a straightforward application of, of the Marshallian supply and demand analysis. So here I'm uh, adapting that from the uh, neoclassical view. Hayek does the same thing. So loanable funds theory was closely identified with Dennis Robertson, that's a British economist, contemporary of Keynes and a critic of Keynes's alternative theory, which is the liquidity preference theory of interest. What's the difference between liquidity preference and saving? Saving means saving up for something. That's why people save. Save up for something. And uh, Entrepreneurs will have something ready for them. Uh, liquidity preference means hang on to your money and don't spend any of it, okay? And that's what causes problems with Keynesian economics. So there's Dennis Robertson. Give him credit for that. On the suggestion of Heron, who was a sympathetic expositor of the Keynesian system, Keynes included in his general theory, it's on page 180. You should look, look at that when you're here sometime. Uh, a graphical rendition of the loanable funds market. Well, Herod told him he needs to push to put that in. Well, he did put it in. So he put it in, but only to emphasize he was creating it, he was throwing it out, okay? Because it, it interfered with his liquidity preference. Uh, theory of interest. And worse yet, if you look at, if you actually look at page 80, you'll, you'll see that he fouled up on the whole thing. Uh, he has the curves curving the wrong way, doesn't work. Uh, and he forgot to label the axles, the axes. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> look at page 180. <laughs> Okay, so if people become more future-oriented, they increase their saving, causing the interest rate to fall, and thereby encouraging business communities to undertake more investment projects. So watch the saving curve shift right. There it goes. You might get tired of that, but we'll leave it. <laughs> okay. So with a given technology, the equality of saving investment is prerequisite to genuine, sustainable economic growth. Now the loanable funds market and the PPF tell mutually re reinforcing stories. So we can put them together. So you've got investment up here and you've got investment down there and then the things work out together. Right. So the loanable funds market shows how the interest rate brings saving and investment into line with one another. That's right. The PPF shows how the trade-off is struck between consumption and investment. The market adjustments in output, prices, wages, and other inputs keep the economy functioning on the PPF. 
So these two elements of capital-based macroeconomics show the pattern of movements in consumption, saving, and investment, and the interest rate that are consistent with the change in intertemporal preferences. So if people start saving, then this thing changes, and we can watch that. As before, let people become more future-oriented. They save more, which transmits a signal, a lower interest rate to the business community. So watch the saving-induced decrease in interest rate and the corresponding movement along the PPF. Here we go. All right, now the lower rate of interest establishes a new equilibrium in the loanable funds market and the economy moves along the PPF in the direction of investment and less current consumption. There could be more future consumption because people are saving up and they're gonna spend the money. They're not just hoarding. Okay, even uh, the possibility that a market economy could work in this way is at odds with Keynesian theory. Note that the more, note that more investment is undertaking as consumption falls. Well, sure, I mean, you just move along the curve and that has to happen. That's, that's the trade-off, all right? Now look at Keynes. Uh, according to Keynes, however, the reduction in consumer spending would result in excess inventories, which would cause uh, production cutbacks, worker layoffs, and a spiraling down of income and expenditures. The economy would go into recession and the business community would commit less, to commit itself less, not more to investment. In other words, what happens, it goes off the frontier and down inside the frontier. So you get a depression. You get a depression because uh, you really weren't having savings. Uh, you were just having liquidity. Okay. Now, if retail inventories were a representative investment, then Keynes would be right. Here the derived demand effect dominates, reducing consumer spending. Uh, it means reduced inventory replacement in general, late stage investments move with, with consumer spending. However, the interest rate effect, and this is what Keynes ignores, he thinks the interest rate is just a, lives a life of its own, Keynes does, okay? The interest rate effect dominates in long-term or early stage uh, investments. A lower interest rate can stimulate industrial construction, for instance, in product development. So to keep track of changes in the general pattern of investment activity, we need to consider the structure of production and the st stage-specific labor markets. That's what comes next here. Structure of production. You've seen this in uh, an earlier uh, show yesterday or the day before. So capital-based micro disaggregates capital intertemporally. Consumable output is produced by a sequence of stages of production, the output of one stage feeding into the input of the next. The temporally defined stages are arrayed uh, graphically from left to right, not from up to down from, that Hayek has it. Uh, the output of the final stage constituting consumable output. Okay. Now there's an early stage. Looks like he knows what he's doing. Late stage. Investment activity is exemplified by inventory management. Well, fine. He doesn't have any consumers, but maybe they'll show up. <laughs> For pedagogical convenience, the initial capital structure is shown as having five stages. 
with growth, the number of changes will increase. Although all five stages are in operation during each time period, uh, resources can be tracked through the structure of production over time. Like so. I'm going to skip Henry Ford here. You've seen him before. So together, the sequence of stages form a Hayekian triangle, the summary description of the economy's inner temporal structure of production. In a growing economy, the triangle increases in size along with the outward expansion of the production possibilities frontier. So let's watch this. So watch the PPF and the structure production expand together. There. When people choose to save, to save more, they send two seemingly conflicting signals to the market. And I say seemingly, that's because if you've got Keynesian economics in your head and all you're looking at is in investment, whatever that is, all right? So uh, here are the two aspects of it. Uh, decreased consumption dampens the demand for investment goods that are in close uh, temporal proximity with a consumable output. This is the derived demand effect. People aren't demanding as much consumer goods. Well, you don't stock as much of it then. Fine. But, but here's number two, a reduced interest rates, which went along with an increase in saving, uh, which means lower bearing uh, borrowing costs, stimulates the demand for investment goods uh, that are temporarily remote from the consumable output. This is the time discount or interest rate effect. So derived demand and time discount are in conflict only if investment is conceived as a simple aggregate, as in Keynesian C plus I plus G. The capital-based macro uh, capital and hence investment is conceived as a structure. Changes in the demand for investment then can add differentially to or subtract differentially from the several stages of production. Can do those at the same time, as we'll see. Keynes theorizing in terms of the aggregate rather than in terms of the structure underlies Hayek's claim, and this is a quote, Mr. Keynes's aggregates conceal the most fundamental mechanisms of change. He doesn't have any structure. He's just got I for investment. So increased saving results in reallocation of resources among the stages of production. The two effects, derived demand and time discount, have their separate and complementary effects on the capital structure. So there's the drive demand effect. I'll, I'll skip reading it because I'm short of time here. The time discount effect, and you know what that is. So watch the structure of production respond to an increase in saving. All right, so note you get an emergence of another stage, a sixth stage, and, but you don't have quite that much consumption going on because people are saving more. So increased saving then has an effect on both the magnitude of the investment aggregate and the temporal pattern of the capital creation. Watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. Like so. And, and so now we see that that's what works. What doesn't work for Keynes is what I showed you before. It would, it would sink into the inner part 
of the PPF. The PPF shows that more saving permits more investment, like so. The Hayek and Triangle shows that capital creation in the late stages, such as retail inventories, is decreased while capital creation in the early stages, such as product development, is increased. And so you get sort of a wrenching like that. The, the, the triangle changes in shape. Structure production is given more of a future orientation, which consists with which is consistent with the savings that made the restructuring possible. That is, people are saving now in order to increase their future, their future spending power. Note the increase in growth. Here we go. <laughs> I just want you to be awake, I think you are. Now down below, I've got a, a graph that I'll show you that just, it just uh, well, you'll take a look at it. As tracked by both the PPF and the Hayekian Triangle, consumption is seen to fall as the economy is adapting to a higher growth rate, all right? After which consumption rises more rapidly than before and eventually surpasses the old projected growth rate. So you see that on that side and on the other side like that. It all it works together. All right. Now watch watch this uh, line here, and I'm showing it pretty dramatic how it drops, and it typically doesn't drop that much. In fact, it might not drop at all. It just doesn't it just doesn't increase as much. All right. But I'm, I make it uh, dramatic. Uh, just so the people in the back row can see what, what's going on here, okay? Looks like that. So you can see what the old project, projection would have been had they not started saving. Uh, well, saving implies a giving up of some consumption in the near future. And you can see that too, uh, where I color it in, I think. Yeah, see, that's what you give up. And what you get, you do it in order to enjoy more consumption in the intermediate and far future. And that's what it's all about, okay? You save up and then you get something later. Okay, finally, stage-specific labor markets. Although a labor market for each stage could be depicted, it'd be kind of hard on this diagram. The pattern of changes Hayek, he calls it the wage rate gradient, gradient. And I only saw that after I'd done this PowerPoint. And I, the reason I hadn't seen it before, it, it wasn't in the 1931 rendition. In 1935, he added a footnote and talked about uh, this wage rate gradient. And it shows up in the graph. So there are the labor markets, right? Now, let's see how this works. Watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. And what you want to watch is the two demand curves because one of them is going to shift one direction and one shift the other. You know which is which, watch it. All right, so you're not having a, doing a lot of stock of inventories, so demand went down, but you're doing a lot more stuff in the early stage, so demand went up. All right, so the differential shifting of labor demands gives rise to that wage rate gradient. And you can even depict it here, just showing that gradient uh, as between those two and the ones in between as far as that goes. Okay, now, yeah, I'm leaving myself just enough time, I think. 
Because look what we've shown. We've got loanable funds market, it's working fine, thank you. Uh, production possibilities frontier, we keep it on the frontier, that's great. Structure production, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not locked in one position, it can move. Stage specific markets, you saw how that worked, okay. That's just the market at work for you and for me. Okay, so there it is. Now we'll show it all at once. So be sure and you see everything, okay. But watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. Here it goes. And, and there you have it, okay. Now, I'm gonna show that once again just because it took me a long time to make it work that way. <laughs> okay, that, that's the way it works. Now we're gonna switch gears dramatically. Okay, we know how the markets work. Then now we can see how things get fouled up. Uh, so this is all about business cycles and is about the central bank as a central uh, doing what it needs to, what it thinks it needs to do anyhow. So look at this. This is Steve Hankey. Uh, he's in, in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and look what he writes. Uh, with interest rates artificially low, see he's got the Fed in play now. He knows what he's doing. He, he's got it down. Artificially low, consumers reduce saving in favor of consumption. And entrepreneurs increase the rate of investment spending, okay? And then you have an imbalance between saving and investment. You have an economy on an unsustainable growth path. This, in a nutshell, is the lesson of the Austrian critique of central banking developed in the 20s and 30s. He's got it, okay? Uh, certainly got it. And I, I would have written something like that myself, but I couldn't have the sternness that he has. <laughs> so pay attention to him. Look at what Hayek says. This was when I was out at Menlo Park when, uh, back in the 70s, and Hayek was in residence there, and uh, he did an interview. I wasn't involved in the interview, but I got, to, I got to see what it was about. So look what Hayek says. He, he's got a, this is what he said, it was recorded, so the, the sentence there might be a little funny. Booms have always appeared with a great increase in investment. Yeah, we understand that. A large part of which proved to be erroneous, mistaken. That, of course, suggests a supply of capital that wasn't made apparent, which wasn't actually existing. What was made apparent, but wasn't actually existing. You get the idea. The whole combination of a stimulus to investment on a large scale followed by a period of acute scarcity of capital is consistent with the idea that there has been a misdirection due to monetary influences and that I general in that general scheme I still believe is correct. He, right. I mean he did the, essentially the same thing that the previous one did. Uh, but this is 1978, long after he had done business cycle stuff, okay? But even at that point, he was still hanging, hanging there with that, with that theory, good for him, okay? So now let's look at credit expansion. This is by the central bank. Increases in the money supply enter the economy through credit markets. The central bank literally lends money into existence. Okay, the new money masquerades 
as saving. That is, the supply of loanable funds shifts rightward, but without there being any increase in saving. There's just an increase in paper money. That's going to cause problems. Okay, so watch the opposing movements of saving and investment as the central bank adds money, delta M, to the supply side of the market for loanable funds. Oh, <laughs> this, was, this was in the Greenspan years, okay. <laughs> Okay, so you get, you get more money. I mean, this is a different story, isn't it? Very different story. So you, you don't get S prime, you get S plus delta M. Thank you very much. <laughs> so responding to the lower interest rates, people actually save less and consume more. The result is because it was a supply shift like that, okay, uh, the result is not a new sustainable equilibrium, but rather a disequilibrium that for a time, and that's important, takes time to see what's going on, okay, uh, is masked by the infusion of loanable funds. So pumping money through credit markets drives a wedge between saving and investment. Just re realize that all of this is, uh, you know, is. Everything's fouled up, you know, wedges and so on. Uh, investors move down along their demand curves, taking advantage of the lower bar borrowing costs. So you can, you can see that. Uh, savers move down along their unshifted savings curve in response to the weakened incentive to save. You can see that. Now look at that horizontal piece. What's that? The discrepancy between saving investment is papered over by the newly created money, which itself represents no investable resources. So there that. You see how it all turns out. So much of Hayek's writing on money is aimed at shifting the focus away from the bedrock relationship between money and the general price level, and towards the intertemporal discoordination that is caused by credit expansion. So favorable credit conditions uh, spur on investment activities, which suggest a clockwise movement along the PPF in the direction of investment. You can see that, okay. I want to go back. So look at the next paragraph. Uh, but income earners are actually saving less and hence consuming more, which suggests counterclockwise movements along the PPF uh, in the direction of consumption. And I say suggest it's only because they, they both can't be there at the same time time, but that's what they're trying to do. The wedge between saving and investment translates into a tug of war between consumers and investment. So one of them is pu pushing upwards, that's the consumers. The other one, other one is pushing rightwards. Uh, and the, and then we can resolve that into a, north a northeasterly direction uh, where you see uh, a position that's outside the PPF. Well, it can be there, it can be there close to there anyhow, but it ain't going to stay. It's going to turn around and go backwards. Now let's look at the, at the triangle. Uh, the low interest rate consistent with future orientation stimulates investment activities in the early stages, but without sufficient resources being freed up elsewhere, many of these uh, investment projects 
will never be completed. So you, you see they started, but they can't complete it because there wasn't really any saving. Compounding uh, the intertemporal discoordination, increased consumer demand draws some resources towards the late stages, further reducing the prospects uh, completing in a new capital structure. So you get something like that. So you get a warped triangle. It's got a bend in it. It doesn't work. The dynamics of boom and bust entail both overinvestment and as shown by the PPF diagram and malinvestment uh, an unsustainable lengthening of the Hayek Triangle. So there you get overinvestment, and then you get malinvestment. Those are different things, different aspects of the same thing. And at the same time, you get overconsumption that's shown in both graphics. So Mises repeatedly used the phrase malinvestment and overconsumption. I have to say, though, it, it was Mises that in, emphasized the overconsumption aspect. Hayek doesn't even talk about that in prices and production, but Mises does. Mises repeatedly used that phrase, all right? So the tug of war that pits consumers against investors pushes the economy beyond the PPF, uh, the low rate of the, the low interest rate favors investment and increasingly binding resource constraints keep the economy from reaching the extra PPF point. All right. Now look at the arrow up there. It, it's headed towards that, but then it, it goes to the right. And some people don't realize why it goes to the right. Uh, with capital theory, there's a lot of complementarity involved. And so if you're building a roller coaster, you've got the whole thing up, and you see there's trouble ahead, but you haven't, you haven't bought the cars yet. Well, you go ahead and buy the cars even though, you know, just try to reduce uh, the problem. Uh, so that's why it turns to the right. The temporarily conflicted structure production called dueling triangles that uh, eventually turns boom into bust and the economy goes into recession and possibly into deep depression. So, like so. All right. Now we've got what Keynes was talking about. He just didn't, ha didn't realize how you get there. <laughs> okay. We're just about there. Now, look at it. Let's see. You can go back there. Wedge between saving and investment. Tug of war between consumers and investors. Dueling triangles. This, this is an economy out of whack. <laughs> and it's because of the central bank. Okay. Padding the supply of loanable funds with new money drives a wedge between saving and investment. Papering over the difference between saving and investment gives play to a tug of war between consumers and investors. Pitting early stage against late stage distorts the hike and triangle in both directions, the temporal discoordination eventually turning boom into bust. And now we can see it. Watch the economy respond to credit contraction. Stay out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's for Nike. How many can identify the other one? That's Joe the Joe the plumber. <laughs> He's giving people a hard time. Okay, we're quitting right there. Thank you.